now, back to G.I. Joe. Hi, guys. Hello, gorgeous. Got a book review for you today, and usually this is the part where I would hold it up and show off the cover, but today's book is an ebook, so I guess I'll just do this. It's The World's Most Dangerous Man by Buzz Dixon, and if you're a Joe fan, here's why you're going to want to read this book. Fan fiction has grown so much over the years that Amazon has decided to capitalize it with Kindle Worlds. They offer a certain number of specific worlds that authors are allowed to write in, use the characters in, and as long as they adhere to certain guidelines, they can publish their fan fiction on Amazon and actually split the profits with the rights holders. One of those worlds is G.I. Joe, and there have been a number of great books written by Joe fans released on Kindle Worlds, but one in particular caught my attention. Buzz Dixon worked as a story editor and a writer on the original G.I. Joe Real American Hero Sunbow animated show, which I am a huge fan of. He brought a lot of that trademark wit and humor to the Joe series, as well as the real-world military feel to it since Buzz did serve in Korea. To give you an idea of how the most dangerous man in the world came to be, Buzz's idea for where the story was to go was to deal with the man who created Cobra, or rather the philosophy behind the ruthless terrorist organization. A brilliant philosopher whose radical ideas were skewed by Cobra into the terroristic organization they came to be. The idea had to be scrapped though when Hasbro requested Dixon incorporate Serpentor, the Cobra Emperor, into the story, as well as the organization behind him, Cobra Law, which was featured in the G.I. Joe movie. The idea for the most dangerous man in the world was shelved for a couple decades until Kindle Worlds came along and Buzz had his chance to share his G.I. Joe story his way with the rest of the world. Now there are certain restrictions implemented by Hasbro when writing a G.I. Joe Kindle Worlds book, such as not killing off an established character or using real world people who were immortalized as G.I. Joes like Sergeant Slaughter or William the Refrigerator Perry. These restrictions don't really bother me because main characters were never killed off on the G.I. Joe cartoon, not to mention the Cobra Troopers or the G.I. Joe Green Shirts. They'd always parachute out of exploding jets or climb out of the flaming wreckage of jeeps and tanks. I was very excited going into the story because it wasn't just written by a fan, it was written by one of the guys who created the G.I. Joe that we all know and love. It's such a rare, amazing opportunity for Joe fans to read what can be considered a lost script by one of the writers of the original show. And right off the bat, that's one of the reasons why I had a little bit of trouble enjoying this as much as I could have. You see, I went into it thinking this is the lost script. This is the parallel universe where the G.I. Joe story diverged down a different path without Serpentor, without Cobra Law, and instead we had an alternate season two. What this actually is though, is a soft reboot. While it uses many of the characters we all know and love from the cartoon, and keeps their character from the cartoon intact, it seems to take place in modern times, not the mid-80s. Now, I'm a big fan of movies and TV shows from the 80s, in large part because of the lack of cell phones. I think cell phones take a lot of the tension away, being able to just call somebody or text them anywhere, anytime. And I'm not a fan of when some of the Joes text each other during an undercover mission. I understand why the change was made to open it up to a larger audience, to younger people who didn't grow up on G.I. Joe, but just because I understand it doesn't mean I have to like it. So I'll get my nitpicks out of the way first and then save the rest of the review for all of the praise. So the first nitpick is the kind of soft reboot, which removes it a little bit from the magic of the original cartoon for me, and it's also an alternate reality as well. While it's not a huge part of the story, it does also serve as a shipwreck origin story, wiping out his origin in the original cartoon. While the stuff in the book with Shipwreck is hilarious, it's still just another thing that distances itself a little bit more from the original cartoon, which I don't think it should have been doing, being that it was written by one of the writers of the original cartoon. I would have loved to have something that was as close in the chronology uh, and continuity of the original cartoon as possible since we've ha we have this amazing 
opportunity to read something by a writer of the original cartoon. But it's not just Hasbro's sandbox to play in. Buzz Dixon also helped build that sandbox, and if it takes these changes to give him the passion and creativity to write a full new novel about G.I. Joe, well then so be it. And the other little nitpick that I feel I should warn potential readers is that there are quite a few typos in this. This doesn't have a huge powerhouse publishing company behind it. It's just one man writing a story that he feels passionate about. And so there are going to be some typos that sneak through. This was possibly a little more distracting to me than it would be to the average reader because I am a writer myself and I am extremely meticulous when it comes to proper grammar, typos. Uh, the book that I've written, I went back and reread it twice just to make sure I caught every single possible typo I could catch. So if you're as meticulous about proper spelling and grammar as I am, it might bug you a little bit, but if you don't know the difference between your and your, then you probably won't notice anything. All right, on to the praise now. I really want to make it clear that I did love this story, nitpicks aside. It has a lot of technical stuff to it. It really does feel like a G.I. Joe episode where as out there as some of the concepts may be, it does feel like it's rooted in reality. For example, there's a Joe base in the Arctic made out of piecrete, which is an actual real thing. It's a combination of ice and sawdust. To tell you the truth, I actually found myself stopping and googling a lot of things that I read in this book, which really did take me back to the cartoon. G.I. Joe A Real American Hero wasn't just another dumb toy commercial. It felt like the stories had a lot of heart and soul to them, as well as a lot of intelligent elements to them as well. And I can't stress enough how intelligent a writer Buzz Dixon is. No, he's not just a cartoon writer. He is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant writer. I love his phrasing and his descriptions. They have that real 80s feel. Very cool, lots of machismo and bravado. And like the old G.I. Joe cartoon, this book does not take itself too seriously. It has the same type of glib humor that the show had. There's one scene where the girl Joes are all getting all sudsed up and washing a sky striker, much like you'd see bikini clad women washing a car. And it's done in a very tongue in cheek, playful way. This time around, Mr. Dixon doesn't have Hasbro telling him you have to include this vehicle and you have to include that vehicle. The vehicles that he does include feel like they were included because they were appropriate for the situation, and there are some vehicles which are included just to make fun of them. Early on, the atrocious G.I. Joe Barracuda mini submarine is included, and Deep Six makes no bones about what a piece of crap the thing is. That's one of the funny things about this book that you won't find in the old G.I. Joe cartoon. The opportunity at self-depreciation when it comes to some of the vehicles. Many times what they would do on the old G.I. Joe cartoon would be to parody real life events as well as other TV shows and that's in this book as well. There is a mission early on where three Joes are sent in as undercover college students, which made me immediately think of 21 Jump Street. If you're a hardcore G.I. Joe fan, there are tons of little Easter eggs for you. And while he isn't allowed to use names because of the restrictions, he does take a few hilarious shots at a certain G.I. Joe boxer and football player. Sometimes Mr. Dixon will use not a code name, but the file name of a character which sounds like it might be a G.I. Joe, so I would, again, stop. I would Google the name and find out, oh, that's actually Colonel Courage or Airwave. These obscure little background characters who just get a moment to shine. And shine is what many of the characters in this book do. One in particular for me was Lifeline, the conscientious objector G.I. Joe medic. If you've seen Mel Gibson's recent film Hacksaw Ridge, Andrew Garfield's character is basically Lifeline from G.I. Joe. A medic caught in a war who refuses to carry a gun and wants to just help both sides. While on the cartoon, Lifeline was sometimes looked at by the other Joes as a wimp or an imbecile, he really gets his chance to shine in this book as the key to unlocking the philosophy behind Cobra. The story is about the most dangerous man in the world, the man who came up with the idea behind Cobra before it got twisted and warped and he has been imprisoned by Cobra for many, many years. But being a brilliant man, he's able to escape. Now Cobra needs to retrieve him, and at the same time, G.I. Joe needs to find this man too, just simply based on how badly Cobra needs him. You have these two opposing forces with these drastically different philosophies going at each other, both going after this man in the middle, 
And I think it's a stroke of brilliance that neither of them can really get to that man. It's only another man in the middle, someone like Lifeline, who is a conscientious objector. He's Switzerland, he's neutral, and he's the only man that the most dangerous man in the world will even talk to. The book does have a lot of humor in it, and it has a lot of great action too, but that's not what it's all about. The core of the story is the philosophy behind Cobra. It's something that the author dangles over top of you for quite some time and builds and builds and builds. And while I was reading this book, I took quite a while to do it because I really wanted to savor it. I was really, really enjoying it and I didn't want to power through it in just a couple of days. As I was making my way through it, I started to become a little bit concerned that the payoff wasn't going to meet the hype. I started to think this man's philosophy would need to be something really exceptional in order to pay off all of this build. And I wondered if it would be possible in the world of G.I. Joe, which at the end of the day is a story based on a toy line. Well, I can say in my opinion, when the payoff finally does come, it is extremely satisfying. Both the character as well as his mindset is really thought provoking. It's the type of thing that at first might rub you the wrong way, but then it makes you cock an eyebrow and go, wait a minute kind of has a point. It's something that a lot of people shy away from today. It's the ugly truth. See, there's a lot of people today that want the truth to be nice and sweet and pretty, but the truth is sometimes a very harsh, uncomfortable, ugly thing. I don't want to spoil the particulars of the character, as well as his mindset and how Cobra has deviated from the original plan, but I do just want to say that in my opinion, it was an extremely fulfilling part of the story. As with most G.I. Joe stories, it does culminate in a big battle at the end too, and I liked how that was handled as well. Looking back at the Real American Hero cartoon series, I didn't feel as though the G.I. Joe movie was a fitting end to the Sunbow run of animated G.I. Joe, and I didn't feel as though the battle at Cobra Law was a fitting place to say goodbye to that particular era of G.I. Joe. I think the location in this book was far more fitting and the situation was more appropriate. While there isn't any swearing in the book, the violence is amped up from the cartoon though. One Joe gets a pretty bad gash during a knife fight and loses a substantial amount of blood. And quite a few ND Joes, the newly deployed G.I. Joes, aka Green Shirts, uh, do die, some of them horrifically. So while you're not going to see any of the main Joes or Cobras die in this, as per Hasbro's orders, there are a few deaths and they do affect the Joes. So there is quite a bit more gravitas in this than was allowed in the original Real American Hero cartoon. The book doesn't have a definitive ending either. It's kind of open-ended, so it feels as though there might be a possibility of a continuation of this story if Mr. Dixon is so inclined. Even though this isn't a continuation of the original Real American Hero world that I thought it was going to be, I would love to see a continuation of this new soft rebooted G.I. Joe world that Buzz has created. It's got great action, great humor, the characters are fantastic, there's a lot of heart and soul, and one part in particular literally had me chuckling out loud when Shipwreck gets his code name. So if you're a huge Joe fan like me, head over to Amazon.com and pick up The Most Dangerous Man in the World by Buzz Dixon. It is a love letter from one of the creators of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, to Joe fans all around the world. Leave a comment below, and to join the tribe, hit subscribe. Nerd Mistake.